You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. It was a different kind of abuse because it was from a woman. Uh, but I didn't say anything. I think I was about five and suppose at that age, I thought it was the norm. I just thought, you know, is this, does this normally happen? Um, and then I think I blanked it out for so long. So and when I did have the courage to tell like my parents, my dad had already passed away and my mum was dying of cancer and I didn't want her to die with that in her yeah, head, yeah, yeah, so it's not nice, is it? I can't remember this because I was a baby, but I can remember the stories my mum told. I mean, he literally come in one night, it is in my book, and he was literally sick. And my mum said there was big lumps, and my mum went, what have you been eating? He said, I've just bit some mug's face off. He actually did kill someone, and they, they brought this fella back to life four times on the operating theatre, where my mm -hmm. dad just actually bit all his face. You never think that anything's going to happen to him, you know? He's like... Superman. Yeah, and... Um, I can remember coming in one day and he was in the conservatory and I sat on his lap and I was cuddling him and um, he had like a tear going down his eye and um, I'm going to get choked now. And I said to him, when you when you go up to heaven, can you um, like come down just to let me know that there is a place up there? I said, at least I know that you've gone somewhere. And he just cuddled me even tighter. You know, he was gutted. He didn't want to let You know, he was a strong man though. He never took no painkillers, no pain relief, nothing. Because he, he protected us till the end. He said, if anyone knocks on that door, I ain't going to be drugged up with um, medicated um, prescriptions. He said, I want my wits about me. Boom, we're on. Today's guest of Kelly McLean. How are you? Uh, not, not so bad, thank you. Thanks for coming on. Uh, you're welcome. So the daughter of the governor, the king of the cobbles, Lena McLean. Uh-huh, Tough 100%. man. They say they had 2,000, 3,000 fights in the cobbles. Very well respected. Died at a very young age, what, 49, 50? 49 he died yeah. of um, lung cancer. Very young, yeah? Far too young, yeah. How have you been? Yeah, not too bad. I had a bit of a roller coaster of a life. You know, but um, like I say, I wouldn't change it for the world. It definitely um, maps you into this person that you are, I think. All struggles in life, ups and downs, makes you a stronger person. Yeah, of course. You've had your own battles as well, which we'll touch on. I always go back to the start of my guest, Kelly, where you grew up and how it all began. Right, OK, yeah. Grew up in the East End of London, Roman Road, Bethnal Green. Um, it was it was different. It was different to our life is now. I mean, we was out playing, you know, um, trying to get a reputation for yourself, I suppose, as a youngster. Obviously, having my dad as Danny McLean, you know, we had to sort of prove that we could stand our ground, you know, and, sh and then earn our own respect, I suppose. Was your dad around a lot when you were younger? Oh, yeah, yeah. He was a proper dad. Don't get me wrong, he was like a real-life Hulk, but, you know, he was a proper dad inside. Like, on a Sunday, we all go out for the day. Yeah. And that, you know, Christmas present, he'd play hide and seek with you and things like that. I don't think people realise that side of him. Softer side. Yeah, definitely, yeah. How was your schooling? Um, school, sorry, did you say? School, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah I didn't like school. Funny enough, I hated school, but yet I work in a school now. That's ironic. Um, my dad was very um, strict on a sky in a school. So if I did have a day off, he never knew. <laughs> Just my mum knew. Uh -huh. <laughs> she was softer. Why was he so strict? Did your dad go to school? He did, but he didn't have a great um, education. I think he wanted um, me to have a good education. But I just think if it's in you academically, then it's there. But it just wasn't. I wasn't that great at school. But as I got older, I sort of improved my education better. How did other parents in that treat you knowing who your dad was? Uh just normal I think really because he was just that normal dad you know I mean obviously if anyone overstepped the mark then you'd see the other side of him but I had great friends and uh, my, my parents got on with their parents really well as well so yeah all good. You were abused as a kid Kelly is that correct? Yeah I was abused by an outsider yeah. From the family? No no from a neighbour um, it was a different kind of abuse because it was from a woman uh, but I didn't say anything. I think I was about five, and suppose at that age, I thought it was the norm. I just thought, you know, is this, does this normally happen? Um, and then I think I blanked it out for so long. So and when I did have the courage to tell like my parents, my dad had already passed away, and my mum was dying of cancer, and I didn't want her to die with that. 
bird like in a hedge. Yeah, 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 so it's not nice, is it? So you dealt with that your whole life without speaking up. Yeah, I think I blocked it out um, for a little while because um, I didn't. I don't know. I just didn't really remember it. I think it's like a, I suppose a black point in me um, in my head. But um, and then all of a sudden something happened to me and it just woke it all up. Something bad happened and I think everything just sort of come uh, back as memory. Kind of unlocked it all and brought yeah. it all to the surface. What do you think your dad would have done if he had found out? Uh, sorry, uh, blank spot, not black spot, yeah. blank spot. <laughs> just remember what I, um, I think, you know, if if he would have known, um, because it was a woman, obviously he couldn't do nothing to her, and, and um, I think he would have probably gone and obviously um, done some damage to the family and probably been in prison for the rest of his life. So I probably mapped his life out for him. What do you, how, when did you start to realise what your dad was all about? Like fighting and stuff? Did oh. you know from a very young age or was it later yeah, on in life? Like I said, it, it was nothing different to me. Like Because like now people go to me, oh, your daddy was massive, got loads of respect, his hands were like shovels. I did not see any of that. All I see was my dad. So we just thought, you know, he's a bent knuckle fighter. Every couple of months he'd have a fight. You know, come home with untold cash that he'd throw in the air, me and my brother Nick, put it under our pillar, <laughs> you know, have great fun with the money. And, we, you know, we had a car, different car every month. We just thought that was like just every family, I suppose. It wasn't until we got sort of teenage um, years that we realised, you know, what sort of dad I suppose we had. What was it like when he used to come in with his face cut and hands cut? Never really seen my dad's face marked. I don't know why... His nose went into a dodgy shape as he got older <laughs> <laughs> because I don't think he's ever got hit in the face. Mm -hmm. um, but his hands, yeah, he used to always have two bowls. One was hot, one was cold. Like ice, then hot ice, and he just iced his hands till they went down. And that, and obviously, see the gunshot wound in his bum. Because your dad <laughs> had a tough upbringing. He had his legs broke and his jaw broke by yeah. his stepdad, yeah. like Jimmy Spinks. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, he yeah, was a wicked stepfather. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, as my dad started getting bigger um, and he could look after himself, then obviously Jimmy left. But my but my mum, my nan asked my dad if he would not like lay a hand on Jimmy, and out of respect, my dad never did for his mum. Do you think that's how it conditions your dad to being violent because of the beatings that he took as a well, kid? Well, I don't know because um, like I work with children and some of them children have had hard um, upbringings and, and a lot of people do try and blame it onto that. I don't think so. I think some of it is, is from that, like where he probably got battered as a child, but I think a lot of it as well is, is um, a chemical imbalance of the brain, which I was diagnosed with at the age of 42. Bipolar? Um, yeah, well, it's cyclophmia, so it's a mild form of bipolar. It's not recognised, and it is hereditary. So I do believe that um, my dad had it, but obviously he, never, he wasn't diagnosed with it. So it was like different personalities at times. Yeah, well, that's what it does. Like, I could be talking to you now, and um, you will say something. I hear it completely different to someone else. So I have to sit and analyse everything someone says to me and I thought count to 10 before I answer because <laughs> mm -hmm. I can take it the wrong way. Um, but since I've written my book, I, is, I have got full-blown bipolar now. So what was it like in your teenage years? Were you angry, trying to live up your dad's reputation, being a girl? How hard was it for you? Mm, no, well, it wasn't really that hard. I, I wasn't... I, I never had to live up to his reputation, I think, because... Um, I was tough anyway, I was just one of them children. I, I wasn't frightened of anyone or anything. And everyone come up to me if there was in trouble and I'd go and sort it out, even at that young age. And, and everyone knew that I could look after myself. So I never really ever got in that situation where I was scared or anything, because I always took after myself. Were you in any, any fights at school yourself? Yeah, when I was younger, I think when I first went to secondary school, I was, it was different then, so it was year one. And the six formers were like picking on me. So the school sent me home. And my mum was thinking, you've sent the wrong girl home. I never, I never turned up at home, like a couple of hours later. And when my mum come past the school, all the, all the six formers was on the floor. And I was standing around. <laughs> and my mum said, you just sent the wrong girl home. You know, they thought they were sending me home to protect me. But I should have sent them home. <laughs> so when you started getting older then, were you working or anything? Did you get a job? Yeah, um, when I left school at 16, I decided to be a hairdresser. 
I think that was because I never had a lot of confidence in myself to go and get some other job. So with that, it's like practical, isn't it? Like you're cutting hair and things. So I thought it was easy. Um, and I was very shy as a child as well, unbelievably. <laughs> but then I went and worked for my uncle in a pub and it brought me out of my shell. And um, I worked behind the bar, really, like for years. And now I'm back working um, at a school which I hated school as a child, but I'm actually working in the school. How are you enjoying that? <laughs> Absolutely love it. Yeah. Um, I'm manager of the after school club, so I look after 28 children every night, all under the age of 10. <laughs> oh, oh, I love yeah. it. The parents come in to pick them up and I'm doing like cartwheels across the, the um, hall, mm -hmm. playing football, run outs, everything with them all around the playground. I absolutely love it. It keeps right. me young. Why did, you, why did you go for that job or change your career? Uh, I went for that job because of my children um, in a school, so I got all the holidays with them. Um, and I didn't realise <clears throat> that um, how it would make me feel working with children, and I definitely think that's my path in life because they just, even if I feel down, they just bring me out of myself and they make me feel good. Did you try and, do you try and protect the children because obviously you went through as a kid? Um, I think I can relate to a, a, a lot of children that, I've had a bad start in life. Yeah, they seem to connect to me. Um, and and I, I just don't want to see kids upset. You know, you've got a lot of heartache when you grow up, losing people, dealing with this, dealing with that. So I just want kids to be happy. Yeah. How old are your kids, Kelly? 15 in May. So they never got to meet their granddad? No, but do you know what? They, it's like they knew him because I keep his memory alive indoors. And um, they met my mum. They was 18 months when she died. Yeah. So they met my mum, but they don't remember her. But mm. um, but they love my mum and dad. I think it's because every day I talk about them. So How old was your mum? My mum was fifty six when she passed. So away. both young to lose your parents. Yeah. Who was it when your dad was at his rough years? When because your dad's been shot twice. Yeah. How was that? When did were you around? Like, can you remember when yeah, the first time yeah. he was shot? Um, well, I can remember because um, when he got shot, the actual dormer next to him collapsed. So when the ambulance came along, they just walked past my dad and went to the, the bouncer that was on the floor. And my dad just stepped over him and walked to the hospital with all like the cheeks of his bum out, <laughs> you know, where he'd been shot with a double barrel shotgun. Did he not chase? Like, did he not get shot with something on a motorbike or a moped and chased them down or caught them? And no. then walked to the hospital, was that a lot of shit? I think I read that somewhere. Yeah, no, because obviously as soon as they shot him, they spun off Yeah, and that. But yeah, no, so he walked to the hospital. He was in hospital for a little while, but he played up so much in the hospital, they sent him home. Why? <laughs> well, he's a bit of a joker. So um, obviously there's people in there with oxygen and he's sitting there smoking. I mean, like, that ain't funny. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, you know, they chuck him out so you can't smoke in here. Then they brought a bloke up and he was um, at an operation. He was stapled from, like, his neck down to his belly button. And they said, Lenny, whatever you do, don't make him laugh. And he said, I wouldn't do that. When the nurses went, my dad put his shoes on his knees and stood behind the curtains and opened it like he was small. And he said, I've just come to visit you. And the, <laughs> the bloke looked round, burst out laughing, burst all the uh, all the staples over. <laughs> because it, I know he was shot twice, but one of the men who shot your dad is at Dalton. I think so, 1992, yeah. but Dalton ended up getting killed. I think your dad was questioned for it, but he never got no. guilty or anything. No. Because I think that was the one where they broke in doors, wasn't it? When, where they kicked the door in and shut up the stairs. I think that was him that yeah. did that one. Mm -hmm. But I think there was a few people after that boy at yeah. that time. Because obviously your dad with the stories, I think it was in a bare knuckle fight as well. Beat the man, broke his two hands, but but his, his fucking windpipe out his... His neck. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, I can. I can't remember this because I was a baby, but I can remember the stories my mum told. I mean, he literally came in one night. It is in my book, and he was literally sick. And my mum said there was big lumps. And my mum went, "What have you been eating?" He said, "I've just bit some mug's face off." And that was obviously in drink. You know, he stopped drinking at the age of twenty-eight. Yeah, was that the, I think that was one of the times he stopped drinking. Yeah, I think he was drunk that night. Yeah. Well, it's he. Um, he. He actually did kill someone and they, they brought this fella back to life four times on the operating theatre where my mm -hmm. dad just actually bit all his face and everything. And I think that's what turned him, knowing that what kind of damage he can do in drink. Yeah, because did he get charged with murder? I think it was when he was a bouncer, he slapped someone and they fell, died, they got done for manslaughter, but he got away with it. Yeah, well, he, he hit him because what it was, this young bloke, he was obviously suffering with mental health and he didn't take his tablets. That's what we were told. So he was going around all the, um, the nightclubs, weeing over children, masturbating, over, sorry, not children, over kids, masturbating over teenagers and all that. And um, 
So my dad took him in a room with his clothes because he was naked, said to him, you need to get dressed. And I think he was swinging punches at my dad. My dad obviously hit him and knocked him out on the jaw. Um, but afterwards, he was seen with police, firemen, firemen and everything. And But they tried to set my dad up for the murder. How was that for your family? How did your mum cope with like, police all the time and your dad coming in with like, blood? How was that a lot of stress on her? Or was she kind of used to it at that time? No, it, it did put a lot of stress on her and she was really ill. And again, that's another story that's in my book. But um, she gave an old mate and she said, it's either that life or us. And, you know, he did turn from that day. I think he stopped drinking and then, you know, it was a bit more bearable indoors. It, you know, it wasn't the norm indoors. It was the only norm that we know, the life. What was he like on a drink, your dad? No, oh, he just got off his head. One mouthful <laughs> of drink, he just got right <laughs> off his head. What was he, six feet three, like 20 stones? Was he that, was six foot unit? three with his... He used to have... Um, <laughs> He used to have these things put on his shoes to make him look like an inch taller. So he was mm -hmm. six foot four when he had his shoes on. Yeah. <laughs> but no one knew about yeah. that. <laughs> because he was a big lump and he's obviously very, very, very well respected, the name the governor. Yeah. The story with Roy Shaw, which is massive, that people still talk about to this day. Did they fight three times? Yeah. Your dad won two. Right, yes. Yeah, what so, is the real story behind all this? So I think the first fight, I don't remember this, but I think mm -hmm. the first fight... Roy Shaw won. Yeah, but I think it was because my dad was out of breath. I don't think it was a knockout or anything. I think it was just he threw the towel in. I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure on that. But obviously the next fight, my dad knocked him out of the ring that cost him 10 grand. Um, Roy shot. And the one after that, um, it was the one where my dad kept um, punching him in the corner and he knocked him down. So, yeah, I think the first fight he lost, it was just because he never trained for it. It was a bit cocky, my dad, and he thought, oh, yeah, I can do this. Thought it was unbeatable. Yeah, and that's what it is. He underestimated himself. Because mm -hmm. so. he was a scrapper as well, Roy Shaw. Yeah. The documentaries. Why do you think they're still spoke about to this day, guys like Roy Shaw and Lenny McLean and the bare knuckle fighting? Why do you think it's so big? Well, I think it's because they, they were different fights to now. When you go, there was action, weren't there? And you're on, the, you're on the edge of your seat, come on, and all that. When you go and watch a fight now, I'm just so bored. I fall asleep. <laughs> I fall asleep halfway through them. <laughs> it's like they're not even mm -hmm. really hitting. It's just like a tiny little jab, and I'm like, oh, how long is this going to go on mm -hmm. for? <laughs> Did you ever go and watch your dad fight? No, I never watched him fight like unlicensed or professional or whatever mm -hmm. but um i i actually see him obviously around the flats when he'd gone on the turn i mean i got jumped when i was about i don't know i was about 13. it's in my book and um they didn't know i was and i went and got my dad um so that was that was a funny night yeah so he knocked the fella out but not with a fist with a backhand eh? so there's too many witnesses looking and that but yeah so that's in my book as well so did they knock many people out with a backhander Oh, yeah. You see the size of his people. hands. They're like shovels. Mm. <laughs> just slapping people for yeah, fun. Just like that, yeah. How was no, it? No, he would never pick on anyone. Yeah, no, yeah. but do you know what I mean? If you slap somebody, he's going to knock you out as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was you. Do you. I mean, when people say you're real life Hulk, I've actually seen my dad's clothes rip. He, like when, he's, when he used to go on the turn, he used to, um, he used to double in size. You'd see him just literally expand and you see all his shirt like split. <laughs> How long did it take him to come down from that with an adrenaline rush, bare knuckle fights and then come home? Was he still buzzing or did it take a couple of days to have calmed down? Well, when he was fighting years ago, bare knuckle, he was drinking. So when he'd have a fight, he'd obviously have a drink, come in drunk and that's when he used to throw his, air, his money up in the air and that. And, um, and then obviously he'd go to sleep and sleep it off. But yeah, the next day, just normal, get up training and everything so I think he knew he was he was very cocky in himself he knew that when he went to a fight as years went on he knew he was going to win he, he knew he, w mm. he wasn't going to lose so I suppose he had the confidence behind him like that yeah what was Lenny McLean's training like for a fight how hard did he train yeah he trains I'd say for a big bloke he trained he trained really well he used to run 10 miles every day um and he used to come in sweating I mean he'd, he'd pick up I think he picked up um one of the heaviest weights, only three people have done it in the country. And he literally, when he come in, he, his face was completely full of blood, his eyes, he burst every blood vessel in his face. <laughs> Try to lift it. Well, he did it though. Was yeah. he had, ever take steroids or anything? Was it all natural? No, all natural. Just yeah. a big fucking lump. Yeah. He's just like, I've got like, I'm a cousin and he's he's like it. He don't train, but he's just he's just whip and that. He's just naturally there. He, he looks really a lot like my dad, my cousin. How did people like, treat you when you were out together? With your dad? 
Oh, like roll. Eh? What was that? Yeah. But every time I was at, my dad would say, there's Miguel, look, my beautiful little girl. I'd go, blood red. I'd say, God, shut up, you mm-hmm. know. <laughs> How was it for you, like, trying to get a boyfriend? Or was people scared to take you out? Or did you keep it all under the radar? No, I wasn't really one of them girls. I weren't really interested in boys. I was like going out and enjoying myself and my friend who always went on holidays. Um, but yeah, I think I had... I think I had one date with a boy, and then that was it. They never turned back up. <laughs> but I can't blame them. <laughs> yeah, they'll probably shut themselves yeah. up. I can remember um, meeting someone, um, and we went out for something to eat. And I do believe my dad's cancer started because he was very strange on this meal. We didn't hardly say a word. And the only thing he did say was he looked up and looked at the bloke and he said, If you hurt her, I'll kill you. And that was the only thing he said all night. And I said to my mum, really, because he ain't like that. He's not normally like that. Anyway, the bloke didn't come back, so. <laughs> <laughs> How, did, the, did your dad do counselling? Did they ever no. go to counselling, no therapy, nothing? Well, no, because years ago, it, it wasn't like, it wasn't the in thing, was it? Mm-hmm. It weren't until, I think, Tony Sobrano, in the Sobranos, that actually see counselling, that people thought, hold on a minute, you know, people do actually do this. You're too much pride to go yeah. and ask for help. I mean, I wouldn't go. When I lost um, my mum and dad, and um, I was self-arming also, I wouldn't go. My husband kept booking it. I didn't want to go. I just thought I've got such a strong mind. They're not. They're not going to help me, and I avoided it. But when I did eventually go, it really does help, and it does work. It's shocking how much it does really help you. How, what made you go? Uh, well, I think uh, what happened was when my mum died, I literally went home. My girls was 18 months old, so I literally just went home. I dealt with my children, just washed, cooked, and cleaned, and I didn't shed a tear. Two years later, all hell broke, broke loose. I was I was um, neurotic, depressed. And then I started self-harming really bad. And it got to the point where literally an hour before getting on the plane, I stood in the mirror and I just self-harmed everywhere. So all my face was cut, weeping, bleeding. And um, i got to say, my husband's not a violent person, but he just lost it and he just strangled me. <laughs> I can laugh at it. But I, I literally couldn't even see anything. The room was going dark and I thought, this is it. I didn't fight back either. And I just think it, it, it took its toll and I knew that I had to do something because my marriage was breaking up. My kids needed me and I was just going down and down that, that wrong road. How long did that How long did that road last before you eventually it came to a head? Was that just years and years from a kid or was that later on in life? Well... I put the self-harming down to losing my mum and dad, but when I look back, I think it was obviously because of the abuse. So it could have been because of that. And it just went on for years. I just, and what happens, I'll pick, then when it'll clear up and I can see I look clear, I'll pick again. I think it was just this anger knowing that I've got this house, I've bought this house, we live in a nice area. Because my mum and dad's dead, they left me money when I'd give it all back and live in a cardboard box, you know, for my mum and dad. So it was just, it just went on for years and I was getting no better. But I did say to my husband, what will happen is one day I will wake up and I won't do nothing. And he couldn't cope with that because I woke up one morning, didn't pick no more and that was the end of it. And then I went into counselling. You know, What were you doing self-harming wise? Uh, I just, I, I still got the mirror now, I hate it. So I got the mirror in my downstairs toilet. I just used to go put the kids to bed. I go straight into that toilet with a needle, pair of scissors, just literally pick away. And I just didn't even realise where the time had gone from eight o'clock at night till six in the morning. I'm still looking at that mirror. Now I know I've done damage and I've only got now two hours before my girls wake up to cover it up. And there's no way you're going to cover it up, is there? Because it's weeping. So, and it just, that was just a routine every Wednesday night I used to do that. I don't know why it was a Wednesday night. Then every Thursday morning I'd ring up and um, say I weren't well for work. And then they realised the pattern that it was every Thursday I wouldn't turn up for work and I got called in and I told them the truth and I got to say my school um, stuck by me. If it weren't for them, I don't know where I'd be. I've still got that job and now I'm manager of the after school club yeah. and you know, I've done well and, 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 I, and I thank my school for that as well because if they wouldn't have backed me up, I wouldn't have had a job. Would I have gone further down that dark road? I don't know. Why, the, why a Thursday? Was that a day that your mum or dad died? Why that a day? I don't know. Do you know what? I don't know why. I, I can't even put my head on it, but it'd be a Wednesday night. So the Thursday morning, the Friday, I wouldn't go to work. Then I've got all weekend. Perhaps it was that. Perhaps I knew I could have two days off. And then I've got Saturday and Sunday for it to clear up. So I'll go back to work Monday. How was that for your husband? A lot of pressure and stress? Yeah. I mean, 
this is why I said that he strangled me. He's not a violent person, but it just he, he just couldn't take anymore. He thought that the best way, if I was gone, perhaps I'd be at peace. You know, so he tried to kill you. Yeah, not in that, not meaning it, you know, yeah. like, because I put it in my book and... and um, He just snapped. He snapped. And, it, you know, it's, it's, it's an hour before we're getting on the plane, a couple of hours before we're getting on the plane. Now he's got to look at me now at the beach like this until the sun clears it up in five days. And oh, he just he's got, over then. Huh? Your holiday would have been over then. Well, exactly, yes. Yeah, so I've ruined half the holiday, but I just, I couldn't stop it. You just, you don't even know you're doing it. You just stand in this mirror and, and then all of a sudden, like eight hours has gone past. What age were you when you first started? Um, I think I, uh, what did my dad die? I was 27 when my dad died, probably about 25. I started self-harming. Just before he died? Yeah. Did and, your dad know this? Yeah, yeah. But he didn't really know how, how, how bad it was. I mean, I can remember one night um, waking up in my flat, going to get a drink, and I see something in the corner of my, my eye, and I thought it was a rat. So I literally ran straight in my bedroom, sat behind my door, and just, sat, just crunched my face, kept crunching it, picking it with my, fa- my fingers. And the next day, it was just cut to pieces, and I had to go and live with my mum and dad, because um, my head just went... It just, I just, I couldn't focus on nothing. I just kept seeing things and everything. And then I was staying at my mum's and I said to my mum, there's a black thing on my back. Can you get it? And I was really skinny as well. So I had anorexic and my mum shouted out to me, dad, have a look. He went, she's got AIDS. (laughs) So my dad went, what? She went, she's got all these um, black things all over her. But what it was, where I kept thinking something was on me, I kept picking it and they were black scabs. So, and I had to go and live with my mum for three months. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I still a young age, though, to begin through all that shit. That just shows you that the tra- obviously the trauma you'd went through. Because people say who are bare knuckle fighters or boxers, even people who train extreme, yeah. is a sense of self harming. So, even yeah. though your dad fighting all the time, that's a sense of if you're, you say you're bipolar and you've seen your traits and your yeah. dad, you're probably exactly like yeah. your dad. Like yeah. his escape or taking the punishment. The fights that he's had would have been a sense of self harming, but it would have been accepted because it's yeah. men fighting. And it's a it's a pain release release as yeah. well. It's like when you like when I get the scab and I pick the scab off, it's so painful, but it's like the pain's gone. It's a, I can't explain it, but I'd never do it again. You know, I know that I know that in my head I would never do it again. I can feel strong, and I am a strong person, and I've been through hell and back really since I've been little with the abuse. Self-harming, plus uh, when my dad got nicked, I had um, anorexia, which went into bulimia, and then depression. You know, I tried to take my own life, but that's in that's in the book also. So I have been through quite a lot, so I've got to be some sort of strong character to still be here now. Yeah, of course, but I always say it, like your darkest days, your days of trauma is where you will keep fighting and push through, and if you push through, you will eventually get light, and then you can eventually start helping others, but... Obviously, with the life you went through, it wouldn't have been easy, even though your dad, big, strong man, king of the cobbles, everybody loved him, showing him respect. That plays a massive effect on yeah. kids' life as well. Do you know what I mean? So it must have been difficult. How was... So when your dad got out of jail, what age were you then? Right. Um, so I must have been about 18. Might be 18, 19. Why did that affect you so much? I don't think that that affected me. That's why I had the anorexia. So it was a stage I had the anorexia. But what it was, because he was in prison, I got away with not eating and throwing my dinners away. No one took any notice of me because everyone was just interested in, obviously, my dad because we knew he wasn't guilty of that murder. So I was getting away with throwing my foods and why no one noticed. But then when he got not guilty of murder, everyone then just spun round and stared at me. Like, my trousers used to wrap around me eight times. <laughs> and then the pressure was on, and then that's when it got worse, I think, because then, then they was all asking me questions, and it was just too much. My brain couldn't take it. Was the police, when your dad was getting to jail and stuff, were you still getting questioned? Were you getting harassed off the coppers or anything? No, no. I've got, I've got to give them their due. Um, they never, ever, ever come in and took liberties indoors. Like, I can remember... Um, when my dad was obviously on remand, there was a knock at the door and it was the police. So they come and searched the house while I was in there, but they never took liberties, I've got to say. They were really good. So that's not too bad because sometimes you usually put the pressure on the kids yeah. or the family and fuck them over to get yeah. the other person to crack. What was your dad like in prison? Did you ever <laughs> visit him? Yeah, very boring. Was he? 
<laughs> well, it was interesting. It was my mum. Mm-hmm. So there's a funny story, um, again, in my book. Well, we used to go and visit my dad and it would just be like, oh, yeah, you're all right, yeah. And then he just completely focused straight on my mum. Just He just loved her to bits. And it was, um, she used to come home sometimes from a visit and she used to look really rough. I was like, bad visit. She used to go, oh, God, I can't take any more. Because she used to go every day. And because the screws were frightened of my dad, they never said his visit was over. So she was there from eight till six o'clock. Oh, no yeah. Yeah, they wouldn't tell him that his visit was over. So my mum was just drained. So she used to say, right, you've got to start coming on visits. So me and my brother would be raring who's going. <laughs> and then when I come back, I said to Jamie, I wonder why she looks wrecked. It ain't from the visit. Daddy's been kissing her. Like, <laughs> full bone kiss in front of me. I've never said so embarrassing all my life. <laughs> <laughs> Tongues and everything. I went, yeah. oh, he's up. <laughs> Is, um, how, did you, how did that affect your brother? Um, yeah, I think, you know, he was the same with me. We just got this, uh, we just cope with things, you know. It's a point of the way you've been brought up and that you have to cope. We've had a different lifestyle to everyone else, I suppose. And I have had a hard life, but I wouldn't change it for the world. It's definitely been interesting, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. Was it, um, what kind of characters were you meeting through your dad's journey? Um, Old fucking nutcases? Yeah, like loads, like, yeah. I mean, he never really brought, like, Serious too much yeah, 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 yeah it was like more like mates you know mm-hmm. that he brought in and that but he never I never really took any notice because someone asked me this a couple of years ago so they said when um, someone was in your ass did you hear any of the conversations I said no nah. I said I wasn't interested I was like 16, 17 out and John so I didn't really my, I didn't see my dad mm-hmm. as who he is like when I opened a site I think it was about five years ago on Facebook I mean, I've got 23,000 people following me on Facebook now. And I have people say, like, his hands were like shovels. I go, really? Then when I look back at pictures, I go, wow, yeah, they was big. Mm-hmm. But you don't you don't notice that because he's your dad. Because you're in his presence all yeah. the time. How does it feel that people even sit and doing these interviews and stuff, that people are still interested? How does it feel, obviously, because you've lived that life, you were, you were there, it won't seem as big. But for people looking outside, people love the kind of... Gangster shit, the villains. It's, people are weird. Like, that's yeah. what it sells, Marshall. Like, yeah. Crime well, sells. Because really, he wasn't. He is not a criminal, and he definitely wasn't a gangster. He was just a one man show, you know. And that's why, like, with my site, it's just based on my dad, nothing else. It still does bug me now. Like, I get in, I get inboxes from people, like, and they go, "I can't believe I'm talking to Lenny McLean's daughter," and um, my mate goes, "Really?" I go, "Yeah." I say, "Well, you know what? He's a little bit of a celebrity." You know, and, and it's nice. Like, I think I don't think he realised the impact he had on people. And I think if he was looking down now, I definitely think he would be, have a big smile on his face. Because he, he I, I, I don't get me wrong, I do have some hate mail as well come, you know, and I do, you know, but most of it is all good. And he's, he's highly respected and, and damn right as well. Because, he, you know, he only done things because he put steam on the table for her, for us as a family. How many fights do you think he's had all in? Is it true between two and 3,000? Oh, God, I, that... I, do you know what? I, I wouldn't even like to start counting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because you know? um, it is weird that people do interact and love. Because look at all the documentaries. How many books has your dad has got? The one book, The Governor, which has ended up bestseller. Yeah, he's got one book, My Dad, the go- um, mm-hmm. sorry, The Governor. Then I've got Married with the Governor, my mum, and I've got my book out, My Dad, the Governor. And there's another, who's the other one? The Governor Through Everyone Else's Eyes, is that a book? Yeah, that's from Anthony Thomas. And, who's that? Um, uh, he's a bloke, um, years and years ago, I approached my mum and said, can I open a web page? Well, we obviously didn't know how to use all the computers, so my mum said, yeah, sure. So he had his, he's had his site open, I don't know, 25 years. And um, so then he asked if he could do a book based on my dad, so my mum said, yeah. And then you've got Lee Wortley that's brought a book out also, um, and he was the ghostwriter on my book, and I do believe he's um, now becoming like um, more recognised as an author. How many, where can people get these books? Um, anywhere, they're worldwide, um, Amazon, any bookstore. You um, had a book for me, but you left it in the house. Yeah, oh, I knew he was going to mention that. Yeah, so I'm going to send, if you give me your address, yeah. I'm going to send it straight off mm-hmm. to you. Yeah. yeah, so we'll leave all the links for the books in the yeah. description. So going forward as well, that all the documentaries of your dad, there's fucking loads out there, there's videos of fights. How did people have all that footage from so many years ago as well? Was everything they'd done filmed? 
Um, I, don't, I suppose it's the internet, isn't it, where they get it all from yeah. now? But I've got like three bags worth of videotapes that every now and then I go through them, but there's so many. Mm-hmm. And then I'll just um, take a video from my phone and then I'll, I'll upload them. But I have had some professional um, videos put together as well that I use on my site. Because your dad's got a film as well, the governor? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's um, my brother's project, that yeah. one. <laughs> Because there's just so much stuff, but all this stuff is recent. What about when I got the phone from phone call from Guy Ritchie to Ben Lockstock? Uh, I can't really remember that one, but I do remember Guy Ritchie coming round because um, obviously my dad was up to be in the next film. Was it Snatch afterwards, wasn't yeah, it? Snatch, and then yeah. when he come in, he, he just like mucking about because he knew my dad weren't well, but he didn't know why or what he had. And he said, "Oh, whatever you do, then don't die before the next film Snatch." And he said, "Well, I will. I'll be dead in six months." And with that, Guy Ritchie nearly fainted. My mum went, "That ain't funny." And he looked at my mum and he said, "Is he telling the truth?" And my mum said, "Yeah, he's got lung, lung cancer." You know, and it was gutted because obviously he was, he was there, he was, his next step to stardom was going to be America, I reckon, my dad. Yeah, because if it was only like 47, 48 when all that stuff came yeah. out, then they still had years because they buy into all that shit. Yeah. All the bare knuckle fighting and rough looking James Bond villains. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? There's loads, of, that's the, <coughs> pro, that's the thing that, there's still opportunities for there, even people in prison like I interview a lot of criminals and people, genuinely, listen, I got a lot of assholes on as yeah. well who are, try and pull the wheel over people's eyes but yeah. there's people out there genuinely changing opportunities that come their way from book deals documentaries films it is because people buy into it yeah. people- this is what I would like from my from my book I would like a box set I think a box set would be good to come from my book because when there's a lot in there my book's like a roller coaster at the beginning it's funny then when it goes into like um the cancer, like my dad's cancer and the death of him and then afterwards and my recovery after of survival, um, it's it's very up and down. A lot of people have told me they've got to put the book down. They have, haven't been able to read the ending for a couple of days because they were crying. What about when your dad, was your dad a heavy smoker? Yeah. How many fags? 60, He roll-ups. He was old oban. My dad old school. Old, yeah, old oban. Yeah. Not fags. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a shame because I used to go running with him. He'd run 10 miles and then he'd get straight on the like the boot of the car, sit on it, and then roll up. And I just I couldn't get my head round it. Very fit man, but and yet he smoked. How was that when you found out he had cancer? Oh, it's devastating, isn't it? It's, I mean, you know, you never think anything's going to happen to him. You know, he's like Superman. Yeah, and um, I can remember coming in one day, and he was in the conservatory, and I sat on his lap, and I was cuddling him, and um, he had like a tear going down his eye. And um, I'm gonna get choked now. And I said to him, "When you when you go up to heaven, can you um, like come down just to let me know that there is a place up there?" I said, "At least I know that you've gone somewhere." And he just cuddled me even tighter. You know, he was gutted. He didn't want to let. You know, he was a strong man though. He never took no painkillers, no pain relief, nothing, because he he protected us till the end. He said, "If anyone knocks on that door, I ain't gonna be drugged up with um, medicated um, prescriptions." He said, "I want my wits about me." You know, so he was still protecting us, even to the end. Did he go for chemo or anything? He had no, but it wasn't worth it. He had radiotherapy to help with his breathing in his lung. Um, and it went to his brain as well? Yeah. Yeah, but he had his wits about him. Then They said to my mum that he won't be able to get out of bed for a little while. And my mum said the day he won't be able to get out of bed would be the day Lenny McLean dies. He said he ain't that kind of man. And my dad, I say he beat the cancer, but the cancer never beat him because he died with all his dignity mm-hmm. and that, you know, and he was like, uh, they reckon it was the heaviest coffin they've ever got. <laughs> <laughs> it's always about How many of bodies it. were on it? How many bodies? Eight? Uh, God, yeah. My yeah. dad was the same. My dad passed when he came in. He was 17 stone yeah. unit and... To see them deteriorate, it's fucking horrible. Yeah, see, he didn't deteriorate. No, I did not. no, this is what I'm saying. This is why it beat it. He was still 18 stone when he died. <laughs> you know, because when he died, I did go downstairs in the kitchen. I said, did oh, not my... even lose anything like no, two or three weeks to before his no. death. I said, like, oh my God. I said, how are they going to carry him down them stairs? Because uh-huh. <laughs> he got diabetic, my dad, when he got cancer. So I used to go and get him great big cream cakes. And the Matt Miller nurse said, that's not good for him. I said, does it really matter what he eats? He's going to be dead yeah, in three months. That's like telling him to still yeah. smoking, isn't it? Yeah. He just used to eat the lot. But the more sugar he had, funny enough, the better, the better day he had. Mm-hmm. So. It's like people, know. you see people that stop smoking at 70 and end up dying weeks later. Oh, like, yeah. I think once you're past a certain age, like people can make changes. But once, if you're being told, you're, did they get told he had six months to get live? 
Yeah, yeah, because what happened was when he, he went in hospital and uh, my mum said to the um, doctor, whatever you do, do not tell Lenny anything until I'm here. They went, no, we won't. My mum was 10 minutes late. My dad rang up and he said, oh, the doctor's been around, got six months to live. My mum was fuming. Why did they do that? I don't know. They don't, they don't hold nothing no more, do they? They just tell you straight away. But my mum pleaded with them not to tell him until I'm there. But um, so when we went up the hospital, it was devastating. I just ran straight over to him, couldn't let him go. Did you ever see your dad cry? No, only I tell you, um, he had a tear on his eye that 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 day. The only other time I've seen my dad show really, really strong emotion is we had a Staffordshire Bull Terrier and she was 18 when she died and my dad absolutely loved that dog and we had the vet come home and put her down and he said to the vet, don't you pick that dog up? And he went, Jamie, you get the dog. He said, I can't have anyone else touch that dog and put, don't you dare put that dog in a black bag. And he went in the front room, he couldn't even see, he couldn't even wash him while they took that dog out. It was gutted. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. I was gutted if my dog died yeah. and I, we were the same but we, we just buried our dog in the garden. Yeah, well, I still got her ashes. I yeah. can't. I know it sounds silly, but I can't face to bury ladies because that's the only thing I've got left from my childhood. Mm -hmm. But I should really spread her ashes where my mum and dad is, but I can't do it. Yeah, it just it, like dogs are. Men's it's something best stupid. Friend, I mean, I've got man. a dog now, Asha. Mm -hmm. It's a religious name, means happy. With all this doom and gloom in the world, I thought I'd start <laughs> off with some positive stuff, and he's absolutely lovely. He is, you know, you love your, people like us really shouldn't have animals. <laughs> how, what, so when your old boy passed away, and then your fucking mum, man, like how would you, how would you think? How, what was going through your mind? Did you know your mum was going to pass as well, or was that a, a broken heart she died with? Or? Yeah, oh, my mum was my soulmate. You know, yeah. I got some funny stories about being my mum, and but she wasn't well for a little while. My mum had a thyroid problem, and she had Gray's disease. So every time she went doctors, they said, Valerie, don't worry. There's nothing wrong with you. It's all the, it's all the um, thyroid. Don't worry. You ain't got lung cancer. Went for a test. Shadow on the art. Yeah, it's, it's only small. It's nothing. Yeah, lung cancer. Then she started feeling funny, all her bones and everything. She and I felt I've got bone cancer. They went, Val, you have not got bone cancer. Went to the doctor's test. Yeah, she's got bone cancer. So upset, so disappointed with that with her doctor's surgery because they should have spotted that with her. And she stopped smoking. Um, she was going swimming. She really did try and turn her life around. But I do believe sometimes your life's mapped out for you. Yeah, I'm the same. I think your blueprint's already there, and yeah. people come into your life, and then they go and that's life. Your life is a roller coaster. That like, even though you're feeling great now, I'm feeling great. There's going to be more shit. Well, is that this you is why I mean? with what's happening in the world? I live in a fairy tale world. My mm -hmm. husband goes, you don't live in the like real world. I said, who wants to live in the real world? I yeah. don't want to know what's going on. I said, your life's too short. I live every day like it's my last. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't focus on too much of the future. Do you take medication or anything? Yeah, I'm on a mood stabiliser. What's that? Just to... Um, that's to level, that which do? I forgot to take it this morning. Hey, the knives. Yeah, so um, yeah, so I take a mood stabiliser in the morning, meant to, I forgot. Um, so that level, so I don't have low and I don't have high, mm -hmm. so I'll stay in the middle. But I do sometimes miss that IPO things so sometimes every now and then i come off of them for a little while and they're all right for a couple of weeks but then i start draining people like where i'm sort of too overpowering start and, cracking up yeah then i'm bouncing off every wall then i'm addicted <laughs> to something like i'll get addicted to crocheting believe it or not and then we can't move my fingers what's that like knitting but it's crocheting yeah. i just sit there for hours so just crochet like mm. hats gloves anything and then i'll decorate the os i can't stop and, and then i can't breathe that like I want to keep talking. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so that's that they just like numbs your brain, just silences that, just keeps it, it does in a balance. Really, yeah. Do you feel that though? Yeah, yeah. And you think the bastards are shutting me down? Like it is a shame because we have. I don't just rely on 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 the mm -hmm. tablet. Like I have to follow a routine. I ain't following a routine at the moment, so it's chaos. I'm eating wrong. I'm not training at the moment, so I need now. I'm focusing now. Monday morning, I'm going to start writing a rota. Because if I don't follow that, that's it. And I was on mood stabilizers. I'm just coming back off them because I've just put a stone and half on <laughs> through the mood stabilizers because they help me like the um, psychotic ones. Is that like steroids as well? Put water on? 
No, no, sorry, not my mood stabilizers. Psychotic tablets of a night, mm-hmm. um, quetiapine, but they're well known for putting on weight. Um, but I can't sleep otherwise. I have to have them, but I'd rather have no sleep. What happens if you come off everything? Oh, they, I'm just like, yeah, it's just all mum Going to explode. Yeah. What about like yoga, meditation, anything like that? Would you do and try any of that stuff? Yeah, I mean, I train. Stuff? I train really, I train really hard. My husband does a lot of yoga, actually. Mm-hmm. But obviously, with all these lockdowns now, so you, you can do it from your Zoom, but I don't know if it's the same, is it? Shite, going, man, yeah. yeah. Than going as a class. Yeah. So, but yeah, I normally train. So I train well, I eat well, then, my, then I feel healthy in my head. Because I don't like, I'm um, self-conscious at the moment. I don't like that I've put this stone on. You know, so then it sort of brings me down a bit. So I know I have to get back on sort of like a routine. Yeah, but you're you're identifying with it and you know, you can make a few changes. A couple of weeks you'll be back to... And I always research stuff now. Like I have sometimes people say things to me just to wind me up. But I now know that you've always got these people that thrive on negativity. So I won't let them get under my skin. What kind of people? Trolls? Yeah, some trolls and I... um, I can't say too much, but I've got someone that obviously always tries to wind me up and I know that they're thriving off of me, so I won't retaliate anymore. Yeah, silence is golden. Yeah, yeah. Silence is I golden. That's now. what I've learnt. Like, just keep doing what you do. Yeah. Like, I mean, I put a video up the other day because um, I've done a podcast the other day. Yeah, Billy Moore, shout out to my good yeah. friend Billy Moore. Hi, a, Billy. Yeah, he's a great guy, <laughs> and, man. Uh, um, and <clears> someone <throat> said, oh, is your rare meant to look like that? And I just thought... And I went, why are you jealous? <laughs> then I just blocked them. So they're obviously trolls. I don't know. People just talk shit. It doesn't yeah. matter what you do. You can do the best thing in the world and there's going to be negativity towards yeah. that. You just got to... I mean, I get... You can imagine. I've got 23,000 people on Facebook. So you can imagine they message me all the time and I answer every single one of my messages as but well. But that'll fuck with your mind as well. Yeah, but do you know what? They... They qu- most of them are nice. Most mm. of the messages are really good and really... Um, like they boost me up and th- and they think I'm doing the right thing by keeping my dad's memory alive because of the impact and the messages I'll get are, are amazing, mm-hmm. you know. And obviously I've started to get some. Like if I put a picture up now of me, it gets more likes than my dad. <laughs> 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 so sorry, dad, but I'm overtaking uh-huh. you. Yeah. So yeah. I don't think he would mind. No. <laughs> so after all that then, through all the trauma, all the pain, mum and dad gone, battling from suicidal thoughts, how... Has life been over the last five years, ten years? Um, so right, so when my mum when my mum died, obviously she was my soulmate. When was that? Two thousand. Oh uh, God, that was ten. So it was ten years after my dad. So yeah, it would have been yeah. two thousand and ten. Then. Yeah. So um, yeah. So when she died, my my life just crumbled, and I wanted to die. I didn't want to live, but now I actually want to live. I want to I want to do things, and I want to go out. You know, otherwise I can easily sit indoors and not like, go work, come home, and don't. I don't interact with anyone. I can be one of them because I do like my own company. Are you drinking or anything? Drugs? No, no. I don't no. really drink. I've got to no. be honest. I drink on holiday. Might drink over Christmas. What do you like on the booze? No, <laughs> it depends on what drink it is. <laughs> <laughs> the vodka fucks you up. Well, yeah. A... yeah, see, I can't stand the yeah. smell of vodka, but I, I used to drink um, brandy. Oof. Yeah, see, I like um, Jack Daniels or Captain Morgan. I'm a dark spirit, but my dad yeah. was a dark spirit. Mm-hmm. But if I'm out in the wrong crowd and someone says something, I go and turn straight away and then I, ca- I can't snap out of it all night. How long does it take you to snap out? Days, no, weeks? all night, yeah, uh, the next day. Still thinking yeah. about it. And I'm one of them, if I've got to be in my bonnet, I will not give up. Like I, me and my husband, it was a couple of years ago, and I said something to him, I want to do this. So now he knows he's not going to do it, so he's just put the phone down. But he's asked his mate to ring me. <laughs> so he's rung his mate up, and he said, will you ring Kelly? She's won't, she won't give up on this, I'm not doing it. It was something to do with like reinvesting something. Anyway, so his mate rang him back. He said, I've got to go and have a sleep. He said, why, are you all right? He said, she's drained me. He said, I've been on the phone five minutes. He said, she ain't come up for air. She won't let me even get a word in edgeways and she ain't having it. It's her decision on no way. He went, well, that's why I didn't ring her back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> if I'm on one, then I won't I It's won't just best to let you not, just yeah, let leave do me. your thing. And yeah. this is why I think me and Scott get on. I mean, the man needs a medal. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say that, but yeah. I think you're right. <laughs> I mean, I am. Don't get me wrong. Mm. I'm hard work. Yeah. To live with. You wouldn't know that, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Just stay away from the fucking Jack Daniels, aren't it? <laughs> yeah, I am hard work, and 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 he's quite placid, even though he's like six foot four, and he's quite a lumpy self. He just he just literally walks past me and goes bed. He just ignores me, and yeah. I think sometimes best way to be. 
Yeah, because if he says anything, it just, he knows you're going to erupt like a fucking yeah. volcano, my basically. Girl, yeah, my girl's go, you're very scary, my mate, it's your eyes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but that's just all the shit that you've been through as well. Like, even though the innocent kid is younger, it's the shit that you see. It's your dad being in prisons, it's the fights and then the reputation and what your dad's got. Yeah. We, like, you can block it all out, but every like, person that I've spoke to that's connected to people who are involved in crime or fights, whatever, they do battle with some sort of trauma yeah. and pain. Like, do we really know anybody that's been through that life that's just walking about the streets singing and skipping? No. It doesn't happen that when way. I see, yeah. it's like when I see someone walk about and they've got a green on their face, permanent green, I think, really? Is anyone really that happy? Is anyone really that happy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? I think there is happy people. Like, I'm the same. I'm constantly battling like, yeah. for the fucked up shit that I've came from and manner demons. Life is good from the outside, but I'm still battling yeah. like, I'm doing a six week documentary right now. We've got one week to go. That's why the beard and the but it was just to make some changes. Yeah, I thought I thought you were gonna turn it to Father yeah, Christmas. So. Yeah, maybe that could be my next <laughs> <Any> documentary. <gifts? laughs> it's um like I identify what needs to be changed as well. Like yeah. I'm not drinking, I'm not taking drugs, I'm not gambling, life is good. Yeah. But I still want to work yeah. on myself more because there's always obstacles. Well of course there is, yeah. And 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 people do that, so you foul. So you need to just you know I sometimes look in the mirror and think, do you know what, I'm going to give this all up. I'm not. This was when I was writing my book. I'm not going to finish my book. Give the site up. You know, I can't be bothered anymore. Then I go back in the same mirror and I think, no, you ain't doing none of that. You're Lenny's daughter. Come on, you're strong. You can do this. And 23,000 members later, I've done it. I yeah. mean, I've worked hard at it and I've got a lot of respect on my site, not because of who my dad is, but because of who I am. Well, yeah, well, you've clearly not gave up, even no. on the days that you probably felt like fucking jumping off a, a bridge. Well, yeah, like when I first written my book, I thought I had a book there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, when I typed it up, I had something like ten or 15,000 words. I thought, oh, my God. I thought, I can't give it up because I've told everyone, but, I'm, I, you know, I've done it in the end. How many words is in a book? Oh, God, I think you've got to have at least about 70,000, haven't you? That's a lot. Yeah, and I only had like 10,000. I yeah. thought I did it. Yeah. <laughs> How was it you completed your book? Because in the document, in this podcast, we know you've got a book out, so yeah. we'll leave everything in the description, people. How was it you completed the book? Oh, do you know... Was that emotional writing it? Do you know what? Um, believe it or not, writing the book, the only emotional bit about it was writing about my children. Because... Um, I was self-harming when they needed me the most and that I, I regret that for the rest of my life and I wish I could turn the clocks back. I don't wish I could turn the clocks back and I never self harm because that was the way I cope with things. At least I didn't go out there and take drugs. I didn't drink. I didn't mug anyone. I didn't steal anything. I hurt myself. I punished myself. But I wish I didn't do it when my kids needed me the most. That was and So I left my husband with loads of pointers and I said, I can't do that bit. You were there, you lived it, you'll have to write that piece for me. Yeah, how hard is that when your mind is like that, knowing that you've got kids, knowing that... Because it, the people I've spoke to on the show that's trying to commit suicide and they failed at the attempt, maybe the rope snapped or yeah. something's just happened but they didn't want to do it anymore. When they were doing it, their first reaction in their mind is, I don't want to die, I don't want to do it. Yeah. I See, don't... I never had children when I tried to commit suicide mm-hmm. and I left a note and I literally went to go to the toilet in the night and I collapsed. So I thought, oh, Sandy, it's working. And I woke up the next day, so it obviously wasn't my time. What did you take? Just whatever tablets was in the cupboard, everything, do you know? But obviously I just woke up, you know? I just, I left a note and everything. My mum found me, she looked through the letterbox, I was on the floor and she was screaming my name and obviously I woke up. You know, and, and I didn't want to live them, but I want I, I want to live their life. You've got so much in life, enjoy it, you know? Yeah, you never know when your time's up. Yeah, everybody's got something to offer in life. Everybody's got have, greatness you know? and can do good things. And like. always remember what you've got, not what you can have. Mm-hmm. Like my husband says to me, look what you've got. You've got two beautiful children. I mean, I've got my house. I've got my husband. I've got a great job. I, work with, I love working with children. He said, don't look at what you ain't got. Look at what you have got. And that's what I do now. That's the main objective. I think we can be greedy in life. I think yeah. we're always chasing more, including myself. That's why I've took a six-week kind of break. Like, it's to step back yeah. and just look at everything and go, wait a minute, man, I'm doing great. Yeah. Do so what, what is that why you're not shaving? Yeah, I was not shaving for six weeks. Like, why is that? You don't so, want to use the razor. Yeah, no, I was, <laughs> Going um, back to basics. Six weeks is um, <laughs> no social media. Ah. Uh, going vegan. Yoga every day, yeah. meditation every day, exercise and cold water therapy. So everything natural. Oh, do you know what? Funny you saying that. Every day I have a shower. 
then I turn it on freezing cold until my body goes in shock. I've done mm. that for years. So that's good for you? Yeah, it's good for mental health. My mates yeah. go, you mad? So I stand there till I'm actually nearly in shock yeah, and then I get out. The cold water's good for yeah. anxiety, lowers anxiety, exactly. lowers depression, good for the skin, good for the mind. And food... Um, and like fizzy drinks is no good like and sweets all for mental health see I'm a pescatarian mm-hmm. so I have fish, fish and egg I did try and be a vegan I, I couldn't do it yeah I, I was veggie for two years yeah and then I end up doing a documentary after I came back I end up craving chicken yeah well, and I went and all... vegan oh yeah but vegans the Sainsbury's I haven't got to Sainsbury's because I was struggling at the start yeah it's like that's fucking terrible and then I started to go to Sainsbury's got a big selection of yeah. just everything vegan man it, and it tastes good but not necessarily I'm not going to be here and say oh, everybody go vegan because I don't know everything about it it's just yeah. working for me people can yeah. do what the fuck they want there's people who live to 90 and eat yeah. I watched a programme once on two towns right next to each other one cemetery in there that was all dead 49 55 and things like this other cemetery all 90 and 80 and this this one obviously had a really healthy um lifestyle and the other town never mm-hmm. so it proves i think it is it does it, what, what you eat does definitely oh, shape yeah, your, your life your, well, like your gut's connected to your brain yeah so what you are what you eat so if you're eating exactly. like shit then you're going to be feeling well that's like what shit. i've been doing for the yeah. last couple of weeks so I, I, I just feel like crap inside so you'll just, be battling again but you need to yeah. identify with that and, and jump yeah, well, on I it am, now so monday morning because i'm gonna get myself something naughty to eat tonight yeah it's <laughs> always monday isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. so monday morning i'm gonna go back strict back running and everything so i mean my husband's done about 12 marathons he runs marathons every year that's how he'll be bang on the ball then yeah. like, that's how it'll keep yeah, him he's saying proper if he didn't fanatic. do that if he was to sit and eat chocolate yeah. you two would just fucking kill each yeah. other then i mean he's he's not got an ounce of fat on him you know what i mean he's 40 he's 48 mm-hmm. probably just out running and thinking okay 10 <laughs> mile i may as well just do another 10 so i don't need to go home to, <laughs> yeah. to calm down <laughs> hey, watch what you're saying <laughs> <laughs> is that what he does runs marathons yeah. yeah, he does. You know what I'm upstairs? I'm upstairs hiding. He goes, who's up there with you? I go, no one. He says, well, you stop chatting. I said, well, yeah, no. know. So said, listen, I'm not answering myself back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, fair play, man, but it is tough to, to make changes in life. It is tough, especially, I've never self-harmed myself. Well, saying that, taking drinking drugs is a sense of self-harming. Yeah. For me, it was taking drugs was probably an escape to... Yeah, well, you sometimes you self-medicate, yeah, don't you? Yeah, so something you're hiding, I There suppose. is a kind of... It, it, it all goes hand in hand, like... I loved myself too much to try and... I was a posing bastard, so was, uh, <laughs> I, I didn't want to do anything. But, yeah, uh, yeah, no, fair play for making the changes and kicking on and, and basically want to live. Like, yeah. Everybody's got something to give life. Exactly, no matter yeah. how much darkness you've got, then you can be the light for other people. Exactly, yeah. I so, mean, I've got something as well, what Billy said to me. Billy said something to me and someone said something to my dad a long time ago. I said, you'll be good at this, try it. Billy said the same thing. So I've got something up my sleeve that I want to, hmm. you know, try and do. So perhaps I might be interviewing you next yeah, time. Yeah, man, get it going. Like, so <laughs> I, I say the same to Billy, like, this is therapy and stuff for me. Like, yeah. These are just like therapy sessions. We're just sitting, sh- there's no big notes or questions. No. We're just talking yeah. about life and uh, people can connect because it's real yeah. and it's raw. There's no bullshit. There's no sugar coating. No. It's just fucking life, man. Like, you look at Lenny McLean, everybody thinks he would be untouchable Superman. He's not going to die. Yeah. Well, yeah, this is what we thought. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So nobody's untouchable. Me, men, I think I'm unbreakable though, mentally. Un- yeah. I'm definitely not untouchable, but mentally I've conditioned myself through the years of misery and a wee bit of education to understand the brain. That, Wait a minute. People are going up against the grain if they're going to try and yeah. come and, and destroy me because they're going up against a different fucking animal. Yeah. But mentally, I... I've come through so much that, but you still need to keep on top of it. Yeah. Well, it's like when I went, I went off my head for three months, and like now, I won't let nothing now. That, 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 that never going to happen to me again because I focus my brain too strong now. I won't let anything get in my head that much that will make me go like that ever again. Mm-hmm. In my, I was frightened of my own shadow, and that your mind just is just a weird. It plays weird tricks on you, but I'm focusing it stronger now. I won't, I won't let anyone get in my head like that. Yeah. No, mind. I'm not retaliating to anyone anymore. I'm just gonna go, go just walk, keep walking straight on, and just ignore, and just don't retaliate, and don't let people get under your skin. You're better than that, and that's the way yeah. I see it. That's the difficult thing because we're, we've all got ego, we've yeah. all got pride. We think, fuck it, who are you talking to? Yeah, like, I do. Yeah, don't yeah, get yeah. me wrong. I do want to say that sometimes, yeah. or you know, 
It's just steals your energy, but if you're the kind of person that will not sleep at night through it, no. then it's best just to step back because they'll eventually fizzle out. Yeah. Just See, the thing is, uh, listen, I've screamed in all of the people. I still make the mistake. I'm 49 coming up in May and I still make that mistake. And I screamed in all of at someone a couple of months ago, but I couldn't sleep. So at two in the morning, I sent them a message apologising. I know when I'm in the wrong and I apologise, but a lot of people out there don't. And that's what makes me a better person, I think, anyway. Yeah, best just step back. Let them deal with it. Because and anyway, I can't really resort to violence because I actually... Yeah, whose is this? this is, Change your oh, life, so, put down your knife. So this is... Oh, God. Who's, who's is this? This is... Um, I'll support a campaign with Tony Turner, so it's change your yeah. life, put down your knife. Um, so we just want to make awareness of that, really, because I don't mm. think the children realise, you know, that um, or kids or whatever, when you pick up knives and you stab someone, the damage you are actually uh, going to shout do. Shout out to Tony, because I had Linda Calvi on last Tony. week. I had Linda on a couple, <laughs> two weeks ago, last week Linda's went out, the Black Widow. Yeah, that good? She's, yeah, she's crazy as well, Linda, yeah. man. Yeah. You interviewed someone I know as well, Who? Paul. Paul? Ferris? Yeah. yeah. I know Paul well, man. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 He lives near me, doesn't he, my manor? Yeah. 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 Good guy, man. Yeah. Yeah. What a fucking story he's got yeah. from the past, but just goes to show that people can change. And exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm very close to Paul now. So, yeah. It's funny, though, that through your old boy, there's people you'd have been connected with as well. And yeah. Well, he's, he's friends with uh, my husband, so they should train together a lot when mm -hmm. the gym was open. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. How's your husband? Now then, how does he deal with it? Oh, he must be proud of you, though, to make the changes, because he must have been worried at certain points. Yeah, I mean, you know, he was proud of me. I've done the book and everything. I've got to be honest, and so not, he ain't a great lover of the social media side of what I do, like me and in my Facebook, because as you can imagine, I've got 23,000, probably 20,000 of them are men. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and they do overstep the mark sometimes. I get inboxes, oh, can I take you out? I said, like, I am, got a partner. They still carry on. And, on, and obviously I don't hide it, I'll show him because I'm not hiding anything. But then that's why I think he don't like that side of it. But yeah, he supports me, yeah. Man. But he supports me and all the other stuff. He hates it when I go off the rails like I am now with eating, not training, because he knows that's not me. Because he knows how far you can go though. Yeah. When you're in that he, dark place. Yeah. And he knows that um, like when I'm focused on my training, like nothing's in the way. Mm -hmm. you know and obviously with the new dog we got that's really good for your mental health because I can't just sit in all day I've got to take that dog out so that helps yeah, as to well get out fresh air yeah exercise is key for anybody man just getting out a bit of fresh air just a bit of walking whatever yeah. it is just obviously lockdown there's been a bit of pressure on you as well kind of stuck in the house well, do you know funny enough this lockdown I've gained another job mm -hmm. so I've got three jobs now what is that what are they <laughs> Well, the other one is obviously I do a mid-day assistant in um, the school looking after a bubble of children to help with the teachers. And I am manager of the after-school club. Then I lock the school up at the end. So I just go around checking everything and the offices and everything. And then I lock up. So that's another little extra bit. So it's all in the same building. Mm -hmm. But um, when I get all the holidays every six weeks, I'm off. That's all right, and our schools yeah. are always off. Yeah. Like my, my wee daughter's just went back to school there, <laughs> and now they just took two weeks off for Easter. Yeah, lovely, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> no, sometimes I'm like, hurry, hurry, I'm get all schools back home. Yeah. They seem to always be closed. You packed the right job. I got to be, yeah, I got to be honest. When we break up for the six weeks holiday, after about four weeks, I'm needing to get back because I need yeah. to get back into a routine. Feel and yourself I, slipping. And I re yeah, and I really love the after school club. I mm -hmm. mean, I'm not. I'm, I was shy when I was young. I'm not one bit shy. We've got all the windows open, all the parents are there, and I'm standing there dancing with the kids. Yeah. And that I don't care. They're but all it's just in. gave you a bit of purpose now when you realise that, wait a minute, you know how fast yeah. it is for your life to get took away as well. So yeah. you're just trying to enjoy every moment. I can is... remember there's a lady where I live, Sarah, and her little boy, Lenny. Funny name. Lenny. He's, he's, he's built like mm -hmm. my dad. Because I said you've cursed him with that name. And mm -hmm. he is proper, like, he's got like, a, le a mean left hook as well because he hit my little dog <laughs> Still flying, and every time he sees me, I never forget this. He says, Um, you're always smiling, you're always happy, isn't you? And I said to Sarah, Isn't he lovely? Little does he know I'm broken. But see how kids the kids they fetch start the nice side out of me. As mm. soon as I see him, my face is grinning. Yeah, I just, yeah, sorry, go on. No, so for anybody watching, it's maybe going through a struggle, but at that time, maybe self harming, yeah, anorexic, whatever battles are fighting. What advice would you give for them? For people, um. Ask for help, definitely. I mean, I never asked for any help and I never believed that it would work. I thought I had too much of a strong mind for, for, for um, counselling to help. It really does help. Please don't sit back and, and suffer in silence. That's all I'd say. You just need to speak out and, and don't be scared to ask someone for help because I think... I, 
you know, I never did. Um, but, but you have to be ready. You can't force yourself. You've got to be ready to do it. Like, don't let anyone force you into it. You need to be ready. Yeah. Before we finish up, Kelly, would you like to, we know you promoted your book very well today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anything else you'd like to promote? What's all your social media links? We can buy your book on Amazon, but what other things would you like um, to promote? I'd like to promote my YouTube channel. Okay, I what's need, that called? Um, well, it's just under my Kelly name. Kelly McLean. Yeah, Kelly McLean. Uh-huh. I haven't really changed any names on it yet, so you can find me on there if you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, please. Um, also, my site dedicated to my dad, the governor, the official Lenny McLean site. Um, there's all new stuff on there. Also, my book, My Dad the Governor by Kelly McLean. Mm-hmm. And sorry, can I just say hello to my children, Prudence and Ruby, my mate Karen. Thank you, Alan, for chauffeuring me yeah, today, Alan. Danny and Scott. Hello. Yeah, well done. <laughs> Jay, for coming on today and telling Thank your you story. Very I much. thoroughly enjoyed that. Keep fighting a good fight and God bless you. I will do, and I'll Thank interview you. you next time. Yes, anytime. <laughs>